Welcome back. I hope everybody is safe and healthy and having a good time out there. So I wanted to um, follow up and reiterate what we were talking about last time at the end of the last lecture that I gave, and that is this idea of adiabatic heating and cooling. The fact that air is cooling off as it rises because it's expanding, and as it sinks, it's uh, warming up because it's compressing as it's going back down to lower elevations. And that's what I ended with last time. So we talked about these different rates, how we have a dry adiabatic rate, that's the rate that air cools off at before it's saturated, and that's 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters that it rises. We have a moist or wet adiabatic rate, whoops, sorry about that, go back. Um, wet adiabatic rate, which is five degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters that the air rises. And the reason that we have that wet adiabatic rate so low, or lower than the dry adiabatic rate, is because of condensation. Condensation is taking place inside the cloud, and never forget, condensation is a warming process for the air. So as long as the air inside the cloud, let me get a pencil right here. As long as the air inside the cloud remains warmer than the air, outside the cloud, then um, the cloud will continue to rise. So the, for purposes of this uh, diagram, we assume that all the moisture came out on this side of the mountain, which we call the windward side of the mountain. I wonder if I could actually write that with this pen. Probably not. No, that takes too long. Windward. I'm not even going to bother with the windward. Um, so the windward side of the mountain, and this is the lee side of the mountain, which is the protected side, or the side that we say is in rain shadow. And the reason for that is because as the air descends, it warms up. And remember, we need cooling temperatures in order for condensation to take place. So there's less rain that falls on this side of the mountain than on this side of the mountain, windward side. There's a mountain in Hawaii on the island of Kauai, where they get about 400 inches of rainfall on the windward side of the mountain, compared to about 10 inches of rainfall on the leeward side of the mountain, all because of adiabatic heating and cooling. It's crazy. Go back, why do you keep doing that? Then um, this again just shows adiabatic temperature changes. As the air rises, it's going to cool and we see the bubble expanding. So cooling is going to take place. And then as the parcel sinks in uh, back to the surface, it will warm up at the dry adiabatic rate. So lower air pressure as it gets higher and higher, higher air pressure as it sinks lower and lower. So think of a hot air balloon. Why does a, how does a hot air balloon rise? There's a furnace on board, right? So it cranks hot air into the balloon. As long as that air inside the balloon is warmer than the air outside of the balloon, the balloon will continue to rise. It's the same way with air parcels. So how do clouds form then? Well, we know the recipe for a cloud. Air rises, it cools and expands, and at the lifting condensation level, that is the height the air parcel has to reach before condensation occurs. Lifting condensation level, that is what LCL means. At that point where condensation occurs, whatever that temperature is, that is the dew point temperature. So what is the relative humidity at that point? 100%. Those terms go hand in hand lifting condensation level, dew point temperature, relative humidity 100%. All that happens at that height, at that temperature. So the adiabatic temperature changes then are just brought about by the expanding or compressing of air as it rises and falls in the atmosphere. Unsaturated air warms by compression and cools by expansion at the dry adiabatic rate of 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters or about 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet. And if it rises high enough to cool sufficiently to 
cause condensation, a cloud will form. From that point on, the parcel will cool, but it's gonna cool at that lower rate. At the moist adiabatic lapse rate, you will see these uh, abbreviations all over the place. Moist adiabatic lapse rate, MAR, MALR, they all refer to the same thing. Uh, dry adiabatic lapse rate or dry adiabatic rate. Um, don't get confused with the initials. I'll try to be consistent when I use them on a test, but the moist adiabatic lapse rate is six degrees Celsius for every 1000 meters or about 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So why does that rate change at that point? You have to remember that at that point, condensation is taking place and condensation is a warming process. So that's what happens as air is rising up and down. Uh, so think of these as parcels of air. Think of these as like uh, balloons of air that are mo moving up and down in the air that's already over an area. So there's something called an environmental lapse rate. That's just the change of air temperature in the vertical. And we have weather balloons that go up to check the temperature, the humidity, the pressure, the wind speed. These things go up, I think it's twice a day, uh, and they all go up at the same time. And all that information is sent back down to the surface because the balloons will have a little radio sound attached to them. Um, it's a little instrument package, and it's measuring all this stuff at every level as it travels up into the atmosphere, and that information is sent back down to meteorologists. So they know what is happening in the air that's already over us. So if the ground warms up and there's air that's rising up through that cross section of air, then we're gonna know whether that air is gonna be cooler at every point than the air around it or warmer at every point than the air around it. And if it's warmer at every point than the surrounding air, then that's unstable unstable air and when we have unst instability, it might just be that we see clouds in the sky. If the atmosphere is stable, it's usually just a blue sky. We're not seeing any cloud buildup. And that in a nutshell is how weather forecasting is done. Of course, it's way more complex than that, but just if you understand that, you know, what, how is the new air coming in going to interact with the old air that's already over us? If that air is cold and dry, then not much is gonna happen. If it's warm and moist and the air that's already over us is cold and dry, then look out. So we wanna have these ways that air can be uplifted. What are the mechanisms of uplift? Because that's what we need to have in order for uh, weather to happen. And there are four basic ways that air can be uplifted. We've already seen the orographic lifting. Elevated areas act as barriers, so when air hits a mountain range, the only place that it has to go is up. And we know that rain shadows can be produced on the other side as a result of, of uh, adiabatic uh, heating. Frontal wedging, you've heard the term cold front, warm front. Well, this is how air gets uplifted at cold fronts and warm fronts. So cool air acts as a barrier to warm air. The air of different temperature, it's like water of different temperature. They don't like to mix. They're like oil and water. Um, they will, in, they will, warm air will rise over top of cool air. Cool air will sink in response to warm air. Then convergence. Convergence is when air flows from opposite direction. Air flows in from opposite directions and they converge upon each other. When air converges, the only place it has to go is up. And remember, rising air is unstable air. Convection is the upward motion of warmer air. Warm air rises, we call that convection. Warm air rises, cold air sinks. Rising air is unstable, sinking air is stable. So let's look at a couple of these. This is um, Spearfish, uh, South Dakota. Spearfish, South Dakota holds a weather record because of orographic effect. 
At 7.30 a.m. on January 22, 1943, in Spearfish, South Dakota, the temperature was minus four degrees Fahrenheit when a Chinook, a wind that goes downhill, so this would be a wind on the leeward side of the mountain, a warm wind coming off the mountain, began to blow very quickly. Within two minutes, the temperature had risen to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. This 49 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature is the fastest temperature rise ever recorded. The strange weather patterns continued and an hour and a half later, the wind stopped and the temperature dropped from 54 degrees Fahrenheit to minus four degrees Fahrenheit, a total drop of 58 degrees Fahrenheit in only 27 minutes. That is a world record. Um, so why does that happen? It's because of adiabatic warming. Adiabatic warming can produce these Chinook winds. The Rockies are famous for the Chinooks that come down on the leeward side of the Rockies. You might start out in Den Denver in the morning with snow on the ground and a temperature at about 20 degrees. And then by the afternoon, because a Chinook wind is blowing, the temperature is, has risen to maybe 50 degrees. Chinook is a Native American word that means snow eater. So you know what's gonna to happen to that snow on the ground if that warm air inundates the area. It's gonna rapidly melt. So here in the upper left-hand corner, this is orographic lifting. Air comes up, we see clouds forming on this side of the mountain. Air flow down the other side, air is descending, so it's warming up. So here's our rain shadow over here. This is the lush side. Think of the California coast. Think of um, Fort Bragg, Humboldt County, all the rain that forms on this side of the, of the, of the coast range, the trees that grow over here, uh, the redwood trees that grow over here. Then we drop over the mountain and it's dry. So we, Sacramento, here we would be in the rain shadow. Then on this side, we would have another mountain, the Sierra Nevada. So this is frontal wedging. Um, this is a warm front. A warm front is coming in, so that warm air is gonna be uplifted over the cool air. Cold air is heavy and dense, so it tends to sink. As that warm air is lifted, it's gonna adiabatically cool. So we end up with clouds that are forming. And then convergence, Florida is a perfect place to talk about convergence and convection, because here's what's happening. We have air from over the Gulf of Mexico moving over to Florida. We have air from the Atlantic coming over Florida. Those, the air is converging and then it's going to warm up and convect. It's going to rise. So we get lots of thunderstorms. Uh, Florida is, holds the record and is the, has the most uh, number of thunderstorms of any state in the, in the Union. And then convective lifting, warm air rising, reaches that condensation level, lifting condensation level, whatever the temperature is there, that's the dew point temperature, so we get a cloud that forms. All right, so this picture, this satellite image shows the Florida, this peninsula sticking out into the water. Here's the Gulf of Mexico over here. Here's uh, the Atlantic Ocean here, air coming from here, air coming from here. Every one of these puffballs that you see, those are thunderstorms. These smaller ones might not be thunderstorms yet, but they have the potential to become thunderstorms. I like this image because another thing that you see is these dark spots where there are no clouds that are building up. Anybody know what those are? It's water, the lakes. Um, this perfectly illustrates land, water, uh, heating and cooling. Land heats up faster than water will. So the land is heating up faster. The air is rising over the land. Um, the adjacent water bodies are going to be cooler, so the air tends to sink. So you don't see any of these clouds over the water. Now that doesn't mean that you get one of these big thunderstorms and it can't move over the water. But for the most part, this is stable air all this over the land masses. Look at all of these little, look at those. Dude. They're just all over the place. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, yeah, all these are just, um, the big puffballs are big thunderstorms. So again, uh, 
Florida, number one in thunderstorms, number one in lightning strikes, number one in lightning deaths. Stay away from Florida. Then this is convection. Again, we're illustrating uh, adiabatic heating and cooling here. Dry adiabatic rate, air is rising, it's unsaturated, so it's rising and it's cooling off at 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters. And then at some point, and at this point, it happens to be 3,000 meters. So 3,000 meters is the lifting condensate, let's see if I can write this, lifting condensation level. Um, and at that point, that's where the dew point temperature is. And in this particular scenario right here, the dew point temperature is, can I do it? No, um, my pen is over here. The, two, uh, the uh, dew point temperature is two degrees Celsius. And then from that point on, it's the wet adiabatic rate that the air is gonna cool off at because condensation has taken place and condensation is a warming process. In the real world, this is how this is illustrated. This is in Hawaii, so plenty of warmth, plenty of energy, plenty of water here. So what we see as the day wears on, we will begin to see these clouds that are forming. And by afternoon, they've grown really, 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 really large. So there'll be a rainstorm, then starts all over again the next day. So right here is the lifting condensation level. We don't know what that the height is there because we don't have numbers here. And we don't know what the temperature is there, but we know whatever it is, it's the dew point temperature. And again, I won't um, delay this any further. Um, again, this is illustrating the air rising and falling, what happens with the moist uh, adiabatic rate and the dry adiabatic rate. All right, so we're getting us some clouds now. So we have to figure out how we classify clouds. For the longest time, people thought that clouds were just so variable that there was really no way to, uh, to classify them. But, you know, we're humans. We want to have things classified for us because it's easier to understand if we can put things in different piles. So there was an Englishman by the name of Luke Howard in, I think that, oh, I want to say 1700s, but I'm probably wrong. It might be 1800s. He decided to take it up on himself to start classifying clouds. And he decided, hey, they can be classified by the form that they take and by the height that they take. So for the form, he used uh, Latin terms to describe um, the forms of clouds. So cirrus clouds, any cloud that has cirrus or cirro in the name, those are the ones that look like um, locks of hair, thin and wispy, and they're the high ones, they're the highest ones. Um, and they're thin and wispy looking because they are composed of ice crystals because way up there where they're forming, any water vapor that's in the air is gonna be in solid form. Then a cumulus cloud or cumulo, any cloud that has that in the name has a puffy appearance to it. And stratus, Stratus means layered, so these are clouds that cover, um, that, look, that have a layered look to them, that cover most of the sky at any one time. And then the height, we have four classifications of height. There are high clouds, there are middle clouds, there are low clouds, and there are clouds of vertical development. Um, these heights will vary depending on where you are latitudinally. So in the tropics, it might be a little different than it would be in, at the North Pole or in Northern Canada. Uh, but on average, high clouds would be above two, uh, 20,000 feet. High clouds are going to have the names cirrus, cirrocumulus, and cirrostratus. Middle clouds are from about 6,500 to 20,000 feet, and that middle clouds will have the term alto in the name. So alto cumulus or alto stratus, alto middle level puffy clouds or middle level layered clouds. Low uh, clouds are below 6,500 feet, and some of the names that they can take are stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. 
NIMBO, anything that has the term NIMBO in it, that means that it's a precipitation maker. So a NIMBO stratus cloud would be a stratus cloud with rain coming from it. And then the big old nasty one, clouds of vertical development. The base is low, but these things can tower up to the bottom of the stratosphere. And sometimes if there's enough energy being released in them, and you know what that means, that means condensation is taking place. If there's enough energy released in them, they can poke through into the stratosphere. Look out for those. Something nasty is going to happen as a result of that. A, a massive thunderstorm, maybe a tornado. So these are clouds of vertical development. They are cumulonimbus clouds. I don't know if you can see that term. It looks like my slide is too big there. But cumulonimbus clouds. So let's look at the cartoon version of these. Um, stop that. Go back. So we see the high clouds. Cirrus clouds, sometimes those um, little wispy looks. Um, we give those the term, let me get a pen here again. Um, we give those the term mare's tails. Flip up like that, and that's just the upper level winds that are causing them to have that shape. Then cirrostratus, altostratus, Nimbostratus and stratus. Altostratus and cirrostratus. How do you tell the difference between these? Well, these are the, the cirrostratus clouds are going to be a little bit more wispy. And if you've ever seen um, a, a circle, a, a halo around uh, the sun or the moon, it's because of cirrostratus clouds. If these clouds are high and puffy, they're cirrocumulus. If they're a little bit bigger and puffy, they're altocumulus. See how technical this is? And if they are bigger and puffier, they're stratocumulus. So one way to determine the distance, and this is totally subjective, but you carry something around with you all the time that you can use to determine whether it's cirrocumulus, altocumulus, or stratocumulus, and it's your thumb. If you look up at the sky and you can blot it out, it's a cirrocumulus. If you if there's a little bit hanging around your thumb, it's altocumulus. And if your thumb can't possibly blot it out, it's either a cumulus or stratocumulus cloud. So then here's our nimbostratus, that layered look, rain coming out, and then stratus, just the lower layered clouds. Cumulus clouds are called the fair weather cloud, but if there's enough heat and moisture available, these little innocent looking things can turn into these monsters. Up drafts and down drafts in these things and that's what makes them so dangerous. Okay, that's just another view of them. So these are cirrus clouds right here. These are cirrocumulus clouds. These are cirrostratus clouds. There's the halo around the sun. And then these are alto uh, cumulus clouds. Puffy, mid-layer, mid-level. So cirrus. Sometimes the ice crystals will get so large that they begin to fall out of the bottom of the cloud. And those are called, that's called ice fall when that happens. Those are cirrocumulus clouds. And sometimes those will produce what is called a hole punch cloud. I won't go into detail about what causes this, but planes flying through can be one causing um, uh, the ice particles to get larger, be attracted to each other, and they just kind of fall out, leaving a hole in the cloud. These are some pictures that I took around Davis as I was driving home one day. I saw a bunch of these holes forming. They weren't as, as uh, obvious as the slides before, but there were some, and there, there were planes that were flying around. So these are alto cumulus clouds. Alto cumulus and cirro cumulus clouds can produce what's called a mackerel sky. These are just these clouds that are being sheared apart by upper level winds. 
Cirrostratus can, um, not cirrostratus, sorry, altostratus can produce the watery sun effect. If the clouds are any lower, they're going to be thicker, so they would tend to blot out the sun, but we've all seen this. I don't know, you might not have known what to call it, but watery sun. These are nimbostratus clouds, cumulus clouds, the fair weather cloud, and then various other types of clouds. These are mammatus clouds. I'll leave it to you to figure out why they're called that. But these indicate uh, usually the precursors for a hailstorm, thunderstorm. Uh, it's just where the air in the cloud is getting so cold that the bottom of the cloud is sagging downward. There's another view and another view. And then these are cirrostratus clouds, halo around the sun or the moon. The, the old legend is that when you see a halo around the sun or moon, expect rain within the next three to four days. And there might be a little bit to that because out ahead of a, a warm front, you uh, have cirrus clouds that form. And as the warm front is moving closer and closer and closer, it's gonna bring rain in three to four days. Here's another um, halo around the moon. You can actually see the rainbow effect here. And then these are clouds of vertical development. These things just explode. If you remember that video at the beginning of this chapter where it was time lapse of these clouds growing higher and higher and higher, that's just, you know, just a, a heat monster. And here's another one. This is over the Sierra Nevada in the summertime. These are bad because they can produce lightning to start a fire, but because the air is so dry, any rain that might come out ends up evaporating before it hits the ground. And here's a time lapse of cumulonimbus cloud. So uh, please take advantage of that. It's pretty awesome. And this is a, there's this pilot that takes pictures of thunderstorms as he's flying near them. And there's one that he took and you see the lightning that's taking place inside the cloud. Spectacular pictures. Again, here's, this is what it would look like above. So when the cloud, when the temperature inside the cloud equalizes with the temperature outside the cloud, if there's still condensation taking place, the cloud will grow outward horizontally instead of growing upward like that. And this is back to Florida again. This is another one of those cumulonimbus clouds and that's an anvil top right there. Flat as a pancake. And then this, we see this quite often around here. You might see a cloud like this in the distance and these sheets, these gray sheets coming from it, that's rain. But as you're driving, you get there and there is no rain. And that's because in the, the temperatures that we have here in the valley, the rain can evaporate before it hits the ground. So we see the sheets falling from the cloud, but we don't get any rain. When that happens, that's virga. Virga is just rain that evaporates before it hits the ground. And here's another view. This is in Grand Canyon. I'm standing over here looking out and I'm get very excited because I see Virga. Oh my God. That, so this is kind of the opposite of lifting condensation level. This is like dropping evaporation level or sinking evaporation level. So the temperature down here is too warm. So um, rain doesn't make it to the ground. There's another view. This is just down the road from that. We were up on a hill, so there were you know, a few little drops hitting us, but we look out over that valley and you could actually see where the rain was disappearing. And then these are, we talked about noctilucent clouds, one of the few types of clouds formed in the, above the troposphere. Um, sunlight is still shining on them, so we can still see them um, from our perspective uh, on the ground. But remember, 99.9% .9 of all clouds are forming in the troposphere. Here's some more of them. Very ghostly looking things. Iridescent, 
sometimes they're referred to as mother of pearl clouds too because of these different colors. And then one of my favorites is a lenticular cloud. Lenticular clouds are common oh, on the lee side of mountains. So we get to see them in, uh, sometimes uh, as we're driving uh, toward Davis. You can see the coast range, of course, in front of you. And sometimes you see these lenticular clouds that are forming. So airflow is coming over the mountain and it's pretty streamlined. When it's non-turbulent, we call that laminar flow. And in the air, you're gonna have these moist layers and these dry layers. Well, where there's a moist layer, condensation can occur, and that wind coming over can carve those clouds into really these architectural looking um, uh, shapes. There we go, that's lenticular cloud. Sometimes they get mistaken for UFOs. They can sometimes look actually metallic. This is on the lee side of uh, Mount Shasta. There's some more. And some more. And here's another one. This looks like, looks like one of those collapsible cups. This again is on the lee side of Mount Shasta. The first official UFO sighting in this country was on the lee side, happened in the 1950s, and it was a pilot that said that he saw a UFO as he was flying on the lee side of Mount Rainier. So maybe he saw just a lenticular cloud. These are more, these aren't as fantastic as some of the others, but Still pretty good. I like this one. It looks like a bunch of top hats that are flying through the air. Well, at least one top hat. There's a short stack of pancakes. You can see why people think, wow, it's a UFO invasion. I just put this picture in here because I thought it was so pretty and I like that glow, that pink glow that, that things can sometimes have towards sunset. That's called the Alpen glow, I guess because it's must be a common phenomenon in the, um, in the Alps. This happens to be in the Canadian Rockies though. And then this is a supercell thunderstorm. Look at that tight circulation in there. Um, look at the growth of this thing uh, and the rain coming out of it. So it's that circulation that can produce a tornado. Lightning. We'll talk a little bit more about lightning when we get into chapter uh, 14, I believe it is. More lightning, more supercell thunderstorms, a shelf cloud associated with a supercell thunderstorm. And then these happen as a result of um, air moving in different directions. So they look like waves breaking on an ocean. Uh, and they're called the Kelvin Helmholtz clouds for the two guys that describe that type of, of movement. Usually higher up in the sky and the air can be either going a different direction or a uh, different speed and you can get that type of wave look. That brings us to types of fog. A fog is just a cloud at ground level. What is a fog? composed of the same kind of thing that cloud droplets are composed of. Water, um, fog, the droplets are tiny, so they are able to stay in suspension, just like cloud droplets are tiny. That's how they're able to stay in suspension. So I am gonna stop here because I don't want to um, have a lot of minutes on this and have a, a hard time uh, uploading it to YouTube. So I'm gonna stop with types of fog and I'll pick this up later. So bye for now.